facts, not fear, begins now. Welcome into Newsfeed Now on this Thursday, closer into the weekend. So excited about another weekend. During this time in our country, it seems like these weekends are so valuable for those of us. Friday. If you've got to work on the weekend, thanks for work, working the weekend and keeping the country afloat. Uh, we are all about facts about the coronavirus right now here on Newsfeed Now, so let's do this. Let's take a look at the cases. 842,000 cases in the United States, 46,000 deaths. A leading U.S. model has upped its projected coronavirus death to total by August to 66,000, a 10% increase from its previous prediction. For the fifth week in a row, millions of American workers applied for unemployment benefits. First time claims for unemployment benefits totaled 4.4 million last week. No matter how you look at the data, the last five weeks have marked the most sudden surge in jobless claims since the Department of Labor started tracking the data in 1967. We all love Chick-fil-A. It's going to donate close to $11 million to help communities. The restaurant chain is going to give that to its local companies, its local businesses, so those operators can then use it in their communities. Chick-fil-A employees and their families will also receive some help. The program will run through June. We're all kind of holding our breath waiting for the reopening of our country. The coronavirus has really changed all of 2020. Health officials say it will likely pose a threat, though even past the reopening expectations of this country and individual states, meaning the coronavirus could affect us well into 2020, so late on during the year. Here's John Lawrence. The head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention attempting to clarify his stance on an expected second wave of COVID-19. I think it's really important to emphasize what I didn't say, I didn't say that this was going to be worse. On Tuesday, Dr. Robert Redfield told the Washington Post, quote, there's a possibility of the virus on our nation next winter will actually be even more than the one that flu and coronavirus circulating at the same time. President Trump says Redfield is talking about a worse the U.S. is better prepared now. If we have pockets, a little pocket here, then we're going to have it put out. It goes out, and it's going to go out fast. We're going to be watching for it. But it's all possible. It's also possible it doesn't come back at all. But the world say the virus isn't going to fade away. There will be in the fall. Ultimately, a vaccine may inoculate us against the virus, which would be great and in, in, in a real significant development. But this is this is part of our, our human environment now. Some states, including Georgia, are getting ready to start allowing some businesses to reopen despite the current threat. Other states like Louisiana may not be back in business soon. Yeah, of course I'm worried. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to get it myself. I have been staying inside like this see following the rules. I ain't ready to die. I'm John Lawrence reporting. All right, John, thanks again. Everybody kind of looking now towards reopening. But as John was just the question still remains, though, is this going to be a seasonal thing? Will the summer slow it down and then it picks back up in the months to follow? Here's Jocelyn Mimina with more. Harnessing the fast-moving COVID-19, challenging for researchers who are trying to connect the data as the deadly respiratory virus pushes forward. We study a lot of different respiratory viruses, and many of them tend to be seasonal. Dr. Akiko Iwasaki with Yale Medicine studies the body's immune response to viral infections. The winter is when we see an um, outbreak with the common cold version of the coronavirus. So it is possible in the future that COVID-19 might become a seasonal virus, just like the other coronaviruses. The immunologist says it is too early to tell if that will happen. However, with growing evidence the virus is airborne, there could be a slowdown when the weather heats up. Uh, that is based on the fact that the summer months um, raises temperature and when the temperature outside becomes hotter then the amount of air uh, the water vapor that's in the air also becomes higher basically higher humidity weakens the virus but because we spend most of our time indoors there is still a chance of catching it we still have direct contact as well as uh, fomite transmission, which is when you touch a, a contaminated surface and then you touch your face. Washing hands, disinfecting high touch areas will lower the risk. What to do when colder temperatures arrive? Once we hit the fall again or the winter, uh, this coming winter, uh, we really need to be thinking about humidifying the indoors 
because that's where the transmission happens. All right, let's go down live to New Haven, Connecticut. Jocelyn joins us. Jocelyn, fascinating story. Anything else that you found out that we maybe you couldn't fit into this story? Well, what it is is that the data just isn't there to have a definitive answer to all those questions, but there is growing evidence that it, that it will be a seasonal virus based on what they know about other viruses. All right, so if it's seasonal, I, this is maybe a weird question, but I keep pondering COVID-19. Obviously, that is the coronavirus ID 19. Would it change to COVID 20? That they don't know either. I mean, it could mutate. They they talk about that a great deal as well. But again, because this virus is so new, they don't know a lot about it, and we're still learning so much more. But there. We're here, we are learning more and more about it, but still, there's just not enough out there for researchers to go out on a limb to say definitely something will happen. All right, in speaking uh, with this individual provider, what is that one thing or two things that, that really will become the new norm? We've talked a lot about shaking hands. Will shaking hands go away? Will social distancing continue to be in play? Obviously, hand washing should have always been in play, but now it seems it's going to be a focal point. Absolutely. Hand washing. If you weren't hand washing before, this definitely should have you going. Uh, that is the one thing that people talk about is the hand washing because if you touch your face, the only way you can really contract the virus is if you touch your face and it goes through your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. So washing your hands really is so important. And wearing that mask, um, keeping, keeping the droplets, droplets so that you're protecting others just in case you're asymptomatic and self-isolation, of course, and social distancing all of that we need to keep going to flatten that curve and we're seeing evidence here in Connecticut that that is happening now because of what we are all doing to flatten that curve were you able to talk to doctor if, if I get this right Iwasaki about uh, immunity Iwasaki, to this yes. so if you get this will you become immune to it and could that help out society as a whole if more people have that immunity Absolutely. I've talked to other researchers who say, yes, if we can detect it effectively. The problem is that some of these uh, anti antibody uh, testing is just, just not very effective quite yet. Uh, not all of them have been approved by the FDA. But if they can get it right, it can help. Good stuff. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you taking here on Newsfeed now, Jocelyn. A lot of businesses along the coasts all across the United States were forced to close. Carnival was forced to cancel cruises and thousands of people are still waiting on refunds for those canceled vacations. Here's Sherish Lum Lombard. Most of Cherish. us have to save up for vacations and with the economy the way it is because of the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of people who paid for cruises they didn't get to take could really use that money. But there's a lot of people out here who've lost their jobs now and I know there's other people going through the same thing I'm going through, like, where's my refund? Angela Cannon is thankful to still have her job, but when she's not working, she's on the phone and sending emails trying to get someone from Carnival to tell her when she'll get a refund for her canceled cruise. It's just very frustrating when you can't get anyone to give you an answer. You know, I just want to know where my money is. That's all. Angela booked through Carnival. Paperwork shows cancellation of her cruise on March 21st. It also shows she was supposed to get a refund within 10 to 14 business days. Fast forward 31 days later, still no refund or even an idea of when she'll get her money back. You took it really quick the day I booked it. <laughs> so don't tell me this day and age, you can't turn around and turn that right back to me. I just, I just don't believe that. And she's not alone. There are thousands of comments regarding refunds on the Carnival Cruise Line Facebook page. It's just that unknown element because no one's talking about it. Nobody said anything about it. Somebody has to know something. Let's go live down to Mobile, Alabama. Cherish joins us. Uh, a friend of our show, Cherish, it's been a while. Welcome back to the show. Uh, yeah, let's talk going. about, you know, we talked about the coastline, the Gulf Coast being such a hot spot for vacationers. We also have to remember, though, that these cruise ships, uh, they're a hot spot as well, and businesses have been affected. How mm -hmm. is it going there? Are you seeing any cruise ships anymore there in the Mobile Bay? We have one at port, but it is not moving right now. Um, it, and the thing is, there's no telling when they're going to start moving. And that's the problem is some people still want to take their vacations, but we don't know when that's going to be. But others, as you heard in this story, 
really need that money that they were spending on those vacations because so many of us save up for vacations. So people did. Now they're out of out of work and they need that money so they can put food on the table for their family. I'm sure Carnival at some point will do the right thing, but do you know a timeline on when this is going to happen? And, and do all of these vacationers have that hope that, in fact, they are going to be refunded? In a statement, um, I did talk to the rep for Carnival and I asked him, is there a number that people can call to see when they're going to get the refunds, like with the IRS? Or is there any reassurance Carnival can give these people that they will get their refunds? Why play? And what, and what would you say to these people who are trying to get this money back because they need the money so badly right now during the coronavirus crisis? And the blanket statement I got back basically reads in part that uh, there's no date. They are working as fast as they can. There are millions of people who are wanting their money back. And right now there is no approximate date of when that's going to happen. Before you go, tell us what the reopening plan is there in Alabama. When could we see this? When can uh, things start to get back to somewhat of normal in that part of the country? You know, they're talking about it now. I feel like everybody all across the country, that's uh, something that's on everyone's mind because of the economy. People want to get back to work, but then you have some people just saying it is far too soon. Some medical professionals uh, we heard from last night in Florida, which we are also in Florida, uh, Alabama and Florida, said, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Commissioners are wanting to reopen beaches. Some beaches in Florida have reopened with limitations. But right now, it just it seems like the general consensus is, and especially from Governor Ivey in Alabama, right now is not the time. But maybe soon, maybe uh, by the beginning of May. Sheriff Lombard, thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time. Good to see you again there out of Mobile, Alabama. Let's go to Ohio. A man's family is using his death as a reminder to take the threat of COVID seriously. All of this was after a Facebook post he wrote downplaying the outbreak. Here's Mark Taylor. Calling it madness in a series of Facebook posts in mid-March, John W. McDaniel questioned the coronavirus lockdown and appeared to downplay the outbreak. Weeks later, the otherwise healthy 60-year-old would himself become infected and lose his battle on April 15th. Now, those very posts are being shared thousands of times online next to his obituary, causing more pain for his family and Marion, who remember him as a loving husband, father, OSU fan, business owner, and ornery jokester. Tonight, in a statement, his wife writes, Johnny loved life and everyone he knew with his whole heart. We ask you to remember we are a family mourning an unbearable loss. Use this as a reminder to continue practicing social distancing and keep each other safe. A tragic reminder from a family who knows the threat all too well. Let's go to Ohio now. Christine Varnke joins us now. Christine, uh, first off, tell me about this, uh, this guy who, according to the story, was skeptical about the coronavirus. And, and how did he make that known? And John was actually, his name is John McDaniel, a 60-year-old from the central Ohio area. He was more than skeptical. He went as far as saying that the coronavirus, COVID-19, was a ploy and a hoax. Um, and like the story said, he unfortunately did contract the virus. And then he died um, about a month later after making those posts all over Facebook. And like the story said, the post you know, went viral and his family is kind of putting it out there as a warning to other people because I don't know about you guys, but I know I have different people on my Facebook feed, family members, different friends from walks of life who um, also, uh, you know, they, they, they agree with his sentiments, but, uh, you know, he did end up contracting the, the disease, or excuse me, the virus, unfortunately. What, what are people saying uh, on Facebook? Maybe your station or uh, website's Facebook, Facebook page. What are they saying about what this individual said and then his uh, getting the virus and, and then succumbing to the virus? You know, the comments are kind of all over the place. You read Facebook comments sometimes and they're a little bit disheartening. So, uh, you know, some of them are saying, you know, I, I don't want to repeat some of the comments. Sure. They're not very nice. And others, of course, are saying how sad, how tragic, of course, because it is. At the end of the day, you know, you can believe what you want and post what you want. This is, you know, the United States. But, um you know, those those words did come back and yep. they were posting them side by side by his obituary. So, um, 
you know, people are saying different things on Facebook about his remarks, but um, at the end of the day, it's just sad, period. Without a doubt, Christine, no doubt it is sad. Thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time. Tonight's a big night. I love tonight. I love this, this, this day every year. It's the NFL draft. I love to act like I'm a general manager and I know what I'm doing, which I don't. But this is going to look pretty different. The entire draft is held virtually. All 32 teams and league personnel will be operating remotely. Nearly 60 prospects are also going to be participating virtually. So nobody's going to walk up to the podium and put on the hat. They may get to put on the hat uh, on a video or a web stream. So it should be pretty interesting. Roger Goodell is going to be maybe in his basement, from what I've heard. They're going to pipe in booze. Let's bring in Jack Doles from Grand Rapids. And Jack, I asked them to pipe in booze when I introduced you, but they all <laughs> like you a lot here. So uh, that's all right. We call him the godfather of sports with our company, Jack Doles. How much different will we all really... Uh, uh, well, first off, it's something we've been looking forward to, uh, a sporting event that we can watch all together. Uh, I think Twitter is probably going to have its biggest night ever Yep. Uh, as people just expand on every pick that's made and every move that's made by the NFL. Uh, the, the look, the production quality is going to look unlike anything we've ever seen before because it's going to be on a, a huge, huge scale. Uh, but there'll be guys in their basements. Yeah, the commissioner will be in his basement. I, I believe I've read the booze are sponsored. Um, Bud Light. Bud Light picked up that sponsorship. There you go. It's a, it's a great move by Bud Light. <laughs> the Bud Light boo machine. Uh, and if you don't know, if you don't watch the NFL draft, every year the commissioner gets booed. It doesn't matter if it's the best pick, the worst pick, the m most mediocre pick. It doesn't matter. Uh, he's going to be booed. There's also a charitable element to this, Jack. Yeah, and that's great, too. And that's a, another great move by the NFL to, to get a charitable sponsor and make sure that uh, something good is happening for everybody here. So, uh, yeah, the NFL doesn't miss too many tricks, and uh, they're, they're on top of this one. But they're going to have an, just a massive audience uh, to watch this because the world is so hungry for something like this to happen. And, of course, the draft brings hope. To franchises mm -hmm. like the Detroit Lions, who I've been following for way too many years. Uh, <laughs> well, it also brings hope to all of us who are just wanting something to gravitate toward, some, some yeah. hope, if you will. Uh, very quickly, let's kind of break down the top five picks, and then I want you to talk about your draft special that will be held on most of these websites that are watching right now. When does the draft really begin? Because I think we know Joe Burrow one, Chase Young two. Does it begin at three with your Detroit Lions? I think it does because I believe, you know, the Lions have made it very, very well known uh, that they want to trade down for this pick. They believe that they can get the guy that they want at five or six, maybe seven or eight. Uh, so I'm, I'm fairly confident the Lions will be trading this pick. There's a lot of buzz now that the Miami Dolphins are looking to move up and not to get a quarterback, but to get an offensive lineman. This is a stacked offensive tackle class, the top Five guys there are all guys who can come in and, and start right away. Uh, and so I think maybe they believe that with one of their other picks, they'll be able to grab a Jordan Love or, or somebody like that a little bit later or move up again uh, because they've got so much draft capital with 14 picks. So I, I'm confident the Lions will uh, trade back, but the okay. Lions right now neither Jeffrey Okuda or Derek, uh, Derek Brown or they'll grab uh, Isaiah Simmons out of Clemson. It's just how far back they can go without losing one of those three guys. The country really is questioning this Tua Tunga Vailoa deal. I mean, everybody wants Tua, uh, at least they did a year ago, and now things have changed yeah, so yeah. much. Where will the Alabama quarterback finally land? It's a really good question. We'll, we'll find out which team wants to roll the dice because, yes, he would have been absolutely the number one guy if he had not hip and that hip injury is one that guys just haven't really bounced back from it's pretty similar to what Bo Jackson had right and uh, his career was just never the same after that now medical advances have come and he looked good on his thing but no team has been able to bring those guys in uh, the guys that have questions question marks and red flags for injuries no team's been able to send their doctors to sit down yeah. with that player and uh, do a real thorough evaluation. So you're really rolling the dice here. Well, you, you want to spend the, you want to spend the third pick in the draft 
on a guy that you're not sure how soon he'll be ready and available. You bring up rolling the dice. Las Vegas, for the first time, uh, is going to be drafting a player, and I think the gamble is definitely going to be there for Tonga Vailoa. Hey, we do have a draft special on this website. Tell us about what we can expect. Well, we're going to have uh, next star sports directors from all across the country as part of this. Jared Smalley, our friend from Columbus, will host the first part of the draft. And then Chris Matthews from uh, Las Vegas, KLAS, will host the second part of the draft. So you'll see, really, the first half will be in Columbus. I expect to be on that part where it'll be right now, probably the third pick. I think I'm on from 830 to 845. So we'll break down what's going to happen, and then we'll talk about each of the picks. Uh, after they happen, and uh, Jared Payton from WGN in Chicago, Walter Payton's son, is one of the guys that you'll see on this. Uh, but it'll be fun. Um, if you're getting tired of what you're seeing on ESPN and NFL Network, come join us. Localized and, uh, we'll, coverage. That is the yeah, way we do things uh, with our parent company. Right. Uh, Jack and I go a long way back. Jack, we were supposed to be in Tokyo in a few months. I miss you, my friend. Hopefully in a year we'll get to do it together again. I'm confident we will. There you go. Jack Doles, thanks, buddy. Please Appreciate you crank out taking the pieces. time. Thanks for joining us for this edition of News Feed Now. Have a fantastic afternoon. We'll see you right back here at 1030. Bye-bye.